Okay, so this is uh, lecture four of Philo of Alexandria, Philosopher, Mystic, and Defender of His People by Rabbi Lawrence Troster on October the 8th, 2014. And we're going to be continuing with our look at the political writing of Philo. Uh, if you just remember, he wrote two works in reaction to the uh, pogroms um, in uh, Alexandria, um, which uh, took place in the late 30s CE. And um, the first work was an attack on the governor, um, uh, Flaccus. Um, uh, and the second work, which we're going to begin looking at now, is a, um, uh, an account of the Jewish embassy to seeing the emperor Caius Caligula. Um, this is written after uh, Caligula's death, um, when uh, the emperor Claudius um, was emperor. Um, it, what obviously happened was is that while the embassy was um, in Rome um, and appealing, hi, we ju I just got here, so we're, we're just starting. Um, uh, for those who are listening who weren't here, we had a horrible traffic jam and delayed <laughs> class by 45 minutes. But anyway, um, so w what happened was essentially was that um, the embassy um, went to Rome and tried to appeal to the emperor um, and what you had are two different parties. You had the Jewish party and you had uh, the anti-Jewish party, essentially. And Philo was heading up the Jewish delegation uh, because of his prominence of his family, his own personal reputation. We saw that even from Josephus, who gives a short account of it. Um, and evidently, um, the embassy did not go well. Um, and while they were there was when, um, I mean, because these embassies lasted for several years. They, they just didn't go and come back. Um, so they were there for quite a while. Um, and while they were there, um, it seems that probably uh, what happened was is that that was when um, Caligula's assassination took place. And um, because we know that they appealed to uh, Claudius, um, and Claudius kind of settled things down once he uh, came into power, um, one of the key players in all of this was Herod Agrippa I, uh, the you know king of Judea, uh, who was a close friend of Claudius, um, uh, and so he was instrumental. But um, if we take a look at the outline, which is in the material I gave you last week, um, uh, or sorry, last session, um, what's interesting is that... Um, he begins with a with a philosophical introduction, kind of talking about, you know, where he, you know, where his philosophy is. It's quite fascinating that he does that. Then, uh, in the first major part, he talks about um, the rule of Gaius, and he focuses on. I'm talking about Gaius Caligula. Unlike the work against Flaccus, here the attack is on Caligula. He he, whereas. He, before he puts the primary responsibility of the pogrom on Flaccus, although he does criticize Caligula a little bit in the earlier work, he tends to stay away from it. Um, and um, here his attack is really on, um, on Caius Caligula. He puts him as the real reason for the pogrom. And the reason he does it, interestingly enough, is a character study. Guys, Caligula. In other words, it begins, um, if you look at, um, so it, the, the work begins on 757 in our edition. And um, 757, and the, um, the, what um, he does is originally, as I said, he has this, um, uh, uh, a philosophical uh, uh, introduction. Um, he talks about God there and about essentially um, what you might call divine providence in the Jews to some extent. But then in starting in number eight, which is at the bottom of um, uh, 757, he uh, begins with talking about Caligula and his character. And he begins by talking about the optimism of Caligula's reign and how wonderful he was. Because you have to remember, the last years of his, the previous emperor, who was Tiberius, his uh, great uncle, um, were really bad because Tiberius had a ba basically given up a ruling, had retired to, I believe, Capri, where he had a, a had a villa, and essentially was like, you know, 
not ruling the emperor, empire, and so this caused a lot of jockeying around by various forces. So when Caligula, when Tiberius dies and Caligula takes over and he's young and he's vigorous, um, people think there's a great deal of optimism and initially he seemed to be doing all kinds of good things, okay? But then um, what happens is that um, he says in um, the eighth month, this is on 758, number 14, um, he says, a severe disease attacked Gaius Caligula, and he sees there a change in character, uh, a degeneration of it. And that goes from 14 to 21, his disease and his recovery. Um, and then starting in 22, you begin to, he begins to talk about his hypocrisy, his character degeneration, and it starts with the, um, well, depends. It may have been a murder, it may have been a forced suicide, because one of the ways in which Romans uh, rulers often got rid of people was they effectively said to them, if you don't commit suicide, we will put you to death in a horrible way, and we will put to death um, your family. If you commit suicide, we won't kill your family, we won't take away their property, you know, because if you're murdered as a criminal, then your property will be, um, you know, will be seized and all that kind of thing. So he forcibly commits um, Tiberius Gemellus to commit suicide. Now you have to understand, Gemellus, this is a reminder, was the grandson of Tiberius, the previous emperor, and actually had a far more legitimate um, uh, uh, line to the throne than Caius Caligula. And in fact, the emperor Tiberius had in fact said that the two of them should rule jointly. But Gemellus was a little younger, um, and Caligula got enough support, and he took over, and then he eventually causes Tiberius Gemellus's uh, death, um, in, in addition to which he um, has all forces also the, the suicide of Macro, who's head of the Praetorian Guard, and also his father-in-law, Sejanus, who had been head of the Praetoria Guard but had fallen into disfavor, um, he is murdered. And uh, basically, um, it's blamed on, um, on, uh, on Gaius Caligula. So what happens is, is that um, the public opinion becomes shocked at his behavior, but um, they still not are ready to sort of give up on him. Now, a large part of the book, starting in paragraph 70, number 74 on 763, is how um, Caligula becomes more and more depraved. And um, if you take a look at uh, number 78 on page uh, 764, um, Stephen, do you want to do you want to read that paragraph 78? And uh, 79. For he began at first to liken himself to those beings who are called demigods, such as Bacchus and Hercules and the twins of La Lacedaemon. Yeah, Lacedaemon, yeah. To, uh, turning into utter ridicule, Trophonius and and. Well, forget that. Go to 79. <laughs> okay. In the next place, like an actor in a theater, he was continually wearing different dresses at different times, taking at one time a lion's skin and a club. That's like Hercules, dressing up like Hercules. Both gilded over, being then dressed in the character of Hercules. Another time he would wear a felt hat upon his head when he was disguised in imitation of the Spartan twins Castor and Pollux. Sometimes he also adorned himself with ivy and a thyrsus and the skins of fawns so as to appear in the guise of Bacchus. Okay, so he's beginning to try and, in effect, um, uh, claiming that he is divine. And, in, and, and, and so, um, if you look at 93 um, on 765, he says, but the madness and frenzy to which he gave way were so preposterous, so utterly insane, he even went beyond the demigods and mounted up to and invaded the veneration worship. In other words, he began to dress himself up then like the higher gods, not just the demigods, like Mercury and Mars. Um, and um, uh, so he began to, in effect, claim that he was um, a god. 
you know, the, the novel and then the movie series, I, Claudius, yes. had to have, you had to have taken it from here. Oh, yeah. I mean, well, no, it, these are not stories that are confined to Philo. In other words, if you read um, The Lives of the Caesars, uh, which is by, um, starts with a Ness, I don't think it's Suetonius. Seneca. What? Suetonius. Yeah, Suetonius, Suetonius is right, Lives of the Caesars. You will see there, that, that was, that was um, Robert Graves' primary, primary source for I, Claudius. There are all these stories about Caius Caligula's depravity and all, uh, sexual things and orgies and uh, yes, that's exactly what they did in the in the novel in the series. There have been some historians who've been wondering whether or not uh, all of this is true and that it was you know propaganda um, by maybe by Claudius or, or you know to um, justify uh, Caligula's assassination. Because remember, when he he is the first emperor to be assassinated, that is a very horrible thing. What yeah. about Julius Caesar? Julius Caesar wasn't an emperor yet, you see. Augustus was the first, Tiberius yeah. was the second, and there was a line of succession, and there was supposed to be a clean line of succession, and the fact is is that um, you know Caligula um, was be, obviously became so terrible that the Praetorian Guard assassinated him and um, made uh, his uncle uh, Claudius emperor. Putin, Putin is doing the same thing. <laughs> so what what does yeah Derek Jacobi great actor. So what happened was, if you look at one fourteen, um, he uh, this is where it comes into uh, conflict with the Jews. Okay, so remember Caligula. This is on page seven sixty seven. Is now claiming in effect to be a god. All right, so this is going to cause problems. So, um, Steve, you want to read from 114 on? Have we not then? Have we not then learned from all these instances that Gaius ought not to be likened to any god and not even to any demigod inasmuch as he was neither the same nature nor the same essence nor even the same wishes and intentions as any one of them. But appetite, as it seems, is a blind thing and especially so when it takes to itself vainglorious and vaingloriousness and ambition in conjunction with the great greatest power by which we who were previously unfortunate are utterly destroyed. For he regarded the Jews with most special suspicion as if they were the only persons who cherished, who cherished wishes opposed to his and who had been taught in a manner from their very swaddling clothes by their parents and teachers and instructors and even before that by their holy laws and also by their unwritten maxims and customs to believe that there was but one God, their Father, and the Creator of the world. So, you know, this is going to cause it. And what, what's interesting is, is that he talks about holy laws and unwritten maxims and customs. Uh, we know that in addition to the, to the Torah, groups of Jews had, depending upon which group and where they were, had what we would call Minhagim, customs, or what later the rabbis, you know, developed in what they thought was the oral law, right? Uh, so it's not only about the written Torah, it's also about other things, which are obviously, you know, the, you, the Torah um, requires interpretation, and day-to-day -day life it requires, um, you know, how do you practice Shabbat? The Torah actually doesn't tell you very much about how to practice Shabbat. So here's one of the proofs that the Alexandrian Jews also had their what we would call oral tradition, in addition to that. Um, uh, read on. For all others, all men, all women, all cities, all nations, every country and region of the earth, I had almost said the whole of the inhabited world, although groaning over what was taking place, did nevertheless flatter him in dignifying him above measure and helping to increase his pride and arrogance. And some of them even introduced the barbaric custom into Italy of falling down in an adoration before him, adu adulterating their native feelings of Roman liberty. What, why, what is he saying that? Because in, in Greece and in Rome, they never bowed down to their rulers. It was considered unmanly. It was considered immoral. They, the Greeks particular would compare themselves with what they consider to be the degenerate Persians who fell down on their faces before the Persian emperor. There are stories of uh, Spartan emissaries going to the uh, Persian emperor who, who just 
did not bow down when they met him, and they were saying, we're going to put you to death if you don't, and they said, we're not going to do it. Um, and the Romans emulated the same thing. They, they had a different ways of saluting the emperor, um, but they would not bow down. That was considered uh, a custom of the, well, here, you know, the barbarians. And the barbarians are anybody who isn't Greek, Roman, or in Philo's is view Jewish. Did they do something okay. like the Heil Hitler thing? Uh, yeah, yeah that, well, it, yeah, they did, they did some kind of hand motion. I don't know exactly what it was, uh, but the point is, um, uh, th that's, they did not bow down. And so here it is, there are Romans now, um, who are bowing down, presumably to the ground, um, uh, for, uh, Caius Caligula, and this is, shocks, uh, a lot of people to do it. Um, read a little bit further. But the single nation. But the single nation of the Jews being accepted from these actions was suspected by him of wishing to counteract his desires, since it was accustomed to embrace voluntary death as an entrance to immortality, for the sake of not permitting any of their national or hereditary customs to be destroyed, even if it were of the most trivial character, because, as is the case in a house, it often happens that by the removal of one small part, even those parts which appear to be solidly established fall down, being relaxed and brought to decay by the removal of that one thing. He's, he's, talking, he's very interesting here. He's saying the Jews are willing to martyr themselves, because by Philo's time there is already a tradition of Jewish martyrdom going back several hundred years to the uh, Maccabean the period of the Maccabean Revolt, when you had people who died rather than bow down to um, uh, idols during the persecutions of Antiochus III. So Philo is very well aware of this history, um, and he's in effect, it's fascinating what he says, that at a time of persecution, Jews are willing to die, uh, even for the violation of a small custom, and his, of course, his idea is that, you know, you can remove something from a house that appears trivial, but it can cause the whole house to fall down. Mm -hmm. So th this is very interesting, showing the Jewish attitude towards an attack upon their tradition. Um, that Philo is saying they're willing to go to the wall mm -hmm. for it. Um, uh, read, read a little, read further. But in this case, what was put in motion was not a trifle, but a thing of the very greatest importance namely the erecting the created, the created and perishable nature of a man, as far at least as appearance went, into the uncreated and imperishable nature of God, which the nation correctly judged to be the most terrible of all impieties. Let's stop there. In other words, Caligula wanted to be venerated as a god, mm -hmm. and that is like so such an anathema uh, to the Jewish people. Um, and in, in effect, um, that's, you know, that's what he does uh, until, you know, 119. And then what, starting in um, uh, 120, he, des he describes the pogrom um, at Alexandria, which is very similar to uh, his description in the, uh, against Flaccus, so we don't have to look at it again. The details, eh, you know, it's much shorter here. And it's not, they don't exactly tally, but they're more or less the same of what happened. Did they have a word equivalent to pogrom that was different from... No, they I, don't. I'm using it because I think it, uh, it's now understand. a term, we see it as a technical term. Right, but they didn't okay. have a special no. word for attack. No, they Jews. didn't. No, they didn't. Now, in 137, he then, um, he does a little bit of, what, of, a, of, a, of a, what's called a panegyric um, on Augustus Caesar, uh, because Augustus... Um, had and, and that goes all the way to 161, um, he, which we don't have to read. Um, he, he, he lauds Augustus in all of these terms um, uh, because Augustus um, was the one who defended the rights and institutions of the Alexandrian Jews. In other words, again, the Jews of the Roman Empire had special rights going back to Julius Caesar even before uh, the emperor, which Augustus confirmed, that they did not have to participate in certain rites and rituals which were counter to their tradition. They also, therefore, the Jewish tradition was respected, legally recognized, and protected. Um, there's a story in Josephus how a Roman uh, legionnaire um, uh, desecrated a Torah scroll and as a result was put to death by the Roman authorities. Okay? Um, this happened in Judea, actually. But 
uh, the point is um, he is lauding Augustus for having done this. He also then talks about how uh, Tiberius um, uh, continued these rites, um, but um, Sejanus um, was one who tried to um, uh, undermine these rites. And remember, Sejanus was the head of the Praetorian Guard uh, under Tiberius. Um, he was, uh, uh, but he was, um, he fell out of, um, of favor. Um, his name was Lucius Aelius Sejanus, um, and he was quite ambitious, and he, um, he was put to death uh, by Tiberius for his political machination. So Philo is blaming Sejanus for the beginning of the attack upon Jewish rights. Um, in 162, he talks about how, this is on page 772, he talks about how the Alexandrians had an influence upon uh, uh, Caligula. So he's blaming the Greek and Egyptian Alexandrians, and he especially attacks the Egyptian courtiers <coughs> headed by a man named Helicon, uh, who was a close friend of Gaius. So they are egging on Gaius to um, uh, Caligula to attack, the to undermine the rights of the Jews. Now, where I want to go next is to 178, which is on 773, where it talks about the, about the embassy itself. All right? So, um, Marianne, do you want to, do you want to pick it up in 773, number 178? Accordingly, we being in great strait and in most difficult circumstances, we, though we had availed ourselves of every expedient which we could possibly think of in order to pro pro propitiate and conciliate Helicon, could find no means of doing so and no access to him since no one dared either to accost or to approach him by reason of his exceeding insolence and cruelty with which he behaved to everyone, and also because we were not aware whether there was any especial reason for his alienation from the Jewish nation. Since he was also exciting and exasperating his master, uh, ex exasperating his master against our people, and accordingly, we left off laboring at this point and turned our attention to what was of greater importance. Okay, so, and what's happened is, is that Helicon has been um, telling all kinds of terrible things against them. They tried to talk to him, but apparently it didn't work. Who is Helicon? Helicon is an Alexandrian of Egyptian ethnic background um, who is anti-Jewish. Okay, he's part of the Alexandrians who come, remember there's two groups, there are the Alexandrians, who the non-Jewish Alexandrians who are Egyptian and Greek, and there are the Jewish Alexandrians, and they come to Gaius in the wake of the pogrom to try and um, you know restore order. Because um, remember, Flaccus, in a, after the pogrom, had uh, had had canceled many of the rights of the Alexandrian Jews, and you know, and 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 really disturbed the entire legal um, setup there. So they were coming. And this was a very serious point. Um, so continue now, where it says, "For it appeared good." For it appeared good to present to guys a memorial containing a summary of what we had suffered and of the way in which we consider that we deserve to be treated. So that's it. They're going to give him a whole, you know, a petition, essentially, of what happened and, and, and you know, and everything of that. Go on. And this memorial was nearly an abridgment of a longer petition, which we had sent him a short time before by the hand of King Agrippa. So in other words, they had mailed him through or sent with King Agrippa because Agrippa had gone on their behalf to the emperor with the original account, and now they're giving him what we would call today an executive summary. Uh, you know what that means, that the person you, you want to read the report is unable or unwilling to read a long report, and therefore you give them a short version. <laughs> Go on. For he, by chance, was staying for a short time in the city while on his way into Syria to, to take possession of the kingdom which had been given to him. But we, without being aware of it, would just... One, one second here. There's a discrepancy here between the Flaccus and this about where Agrippa was when, because according to Flaccus, his he was on his way uh, to Judea 
and came to Alexandria, and his coming to Alexandria uh, with the attacks on him by the Alexandrians was one of the precipitating factors of the pogrom. So here, they have him in, still in Rome. So I'm not really sure how that's resolved, but somehow he's still there. Um, who knows? Go on. But we... One eight, we're at 180. Being aware of it, we're deceiving yeah. ourselves. For before also we had done the same when we originally began to set sail, thinking that as we were going before a judge, we should meet with justice. But he was in reality an irreconcilable enemy to us, attracting us as far as appearance went with favorable looks and a cheerful address. For receiving us favorably at first, in the plains on the banks of the Tiber, where he happened to be walking about in his mother's garden, <laughs> mm -hmm. he conversed with us formally and waved his right hand to us in, protecting, in a protecting manner, giving us significant tokens of his goodwill and having sent to us the secretary, whose duty it was to attend to the embassies that arrived. Obulus by name, he said, I myself will listen to to what you have to say at the first favorable opportunity. So everything so far is good. The embassy arrives. They, they, they go to this garden on the banks of the Tiber where uh, Caligula is. They have his principal secretary, um, uh, meets with them. And so far, so good. Okay. Um, Suzanne, you want to pick it up? It is a, so that all though. So that all those who stood around congratulated us as if we had already carried our point. And so did all those of our own people who are influenced by superficial appearances. But I myself, who was accounted to be possessed of superior prudence, <laughs> both on account of my age and my education and general information, was less sanguine in respect of the matters at which the others were so greatly delighted. <laughs> it's interesting. He gives himself a little bit here, but he evidently is the head of the delegation. He's the elder, right? He's very well regarded. And he is um, also smart enough to realize um, that they may be being played. <laughs> Go on. For why, said I, after pondering the matter deeply in my own heart, why, when there have been such numbers of ambassadors who have come, one may almost say, from every corner of the globe, did he say on that occasion that he would hear what we had to say and no one else? What could have been his meaning? For he was not ignorant that we were Jews, who would have been quite content at not being treated worse than the others. But to expect to be looked upon as worthy to receive the special privileges and precedents by a master who was of a different nation, and a young man, and an absolute monarch, would have seemed like insanity. But it would seem that he was showing civility to the whole district of the Alexandrians, to which he was thus giving a privilege, when promising to give his decision speedily unless indeed disregarding the character of a fair and impartial hearer, he was intending to be a fellow suitor with our adversaries and an enemy of ours instead of behaving like a judge. In other words, he's, he, Philo is not taken in. No. Right? He's not <laughs> taken in by the apparent... And don't forget, Caligula was, was rumored to be, uh, was told to be quite handsome. Um, I think if you looked at the picture of the statue that I uh, included with the lecture, he was quite good looking. Um, so, uh, even though statues usually tended to make them good looking, but nonetheless, and he uh, could be incredibly charismatic and friendly, uh, but Philo is not taken in by this, and he is, uh, he he he's just thinking this is the you know this is not really correct. Um, read on. Having these ideas in my mind, I resisted the sanguine hopes of the others and had no rest in my mind day or night. But while I was thus giving way to despondency and lamenting over my ignorance of the future, for it was not safe to postpone matters, on a sudden other most grievous and unexpected calamity, on a sudden another most grievous and unexpected calamity fell upon us, bringing danger not on one section of the Jews only, but on all the nation together. Okay, now something really bad is going to happen. Go on. For we had come from Rome to Diceorachia, attending upon Gaius, and he had gone down to the seaside and was remaining near the gulf, having left for a while his own palaces, which were numerous and superbly furnished. And while we were anxiously considering his attentions, for we were continually expecting to be summoned, 
A man arrived with bloodshot eyes and looking very much troubled, out of breath and palpitating, and leading us away to a little distance from the rest, for there were several persons near. He said, have you heard the news? And then, when he was about to tell us what it was, he stopped because of the abundance of tears that rose up to choke his utterance. Uh, he's really very clear about presenting what's going on, right? Yes, it, and don't forget, descriptive. ambassadors could hang around for months and months and months before the emperor deigned to receive them, okay? Mm -hmm. So this is not unusual, um, uh, depending upon what was going on. Um, so all of a sudden, this guy shows up and says, have you heard the news, right? Go on. And beginning again, he was a second and a third time stopped in the same manner. And we, seeing this, were much alarmed and agitated by suspense, and entreated him to tell us what the circumstance was, on account of which he said that he had come. For he could not have come merely to weep before so many witnesses. If then, said we, you have any real cause for tears, do not keep your grief to yourself, for we have been long ago well accustomed to misfortune. Okay, and now comes the shocking news. Go on. And he with difficulty, sobbing aloud, and in a broken voice, spoke as follows. Our temple is destroyed. Gaius has ordered a colossal statue of himself to be erected in the Holy of Holies, having his own name inscribed upon it with the title of Jupiter. This is, this is all the while they're trying to see Gaius to talk to him about getting their rights. And, and what he has done is he has ordered the erection of a statue of, Ju temple. of himself in the temple. Now, we know this from Josephus, okay? That, that he, he, he writes, the, we even looked at the texts, you know, he writes the governor, the procurator of Judea, and he orders this to happen. This spreads throughout the Jewish world like wildfire because this will create a revolt. I mean, this is going to, it, it, this is if this had actually happened, uh, there the the Jewish war would have broken out in in the in the in the late 30s, beginning of 40 CE, instead of over 20 years later. So that's what he's that now. This is what he's going to talk about um, over the next little while. Irma, you want to pick it up at 189? And while we were all struck dumb with astonishment and terror at what he had told us, and stood still deprived of all motion. For we stood there mute and in despair, ready to fall to the ground with fear and sorrow, the very muscles of our bodies being deprived of all strength by the news which we had heard. Others arrived bearing the same sad tale. And then we all retired and shut ourselves up together and bewailed our individual and common miseries and went through every circumstance that our minds could conceive for a man in misfortune is a most loquacious animal, wrestling as we might with our misery. And what follows is a sort of a discussion of, you know, why is this happening to us, right? And how are we going to talk to him about it? And, um, you know, if you look at 192, um, you know, even if we talk to him, he's probably going to put us to death, but we're willing to martyr ourselves. Um, excuse me. And, and so, um, and in effect... Um, they also, uh, in 194, they say, you know, what's the point of us trying to, you know, speak on behalf of us as Alexandrians? This is, this is the whole, this is a problem for the entire Jewish nation, right? It's interesting because it shows you how connected they are to the idea that there is a, you know, Jewish nation that all have common concerns and common uh, beliefs and also uh, how holy the temple is to everybody, uh, you know, even these, what we would consider on some level, incredibly assimilated Jews from Alexandria, this to them is like, you know, when it, today when Israel gets attacked uh, for us. I mean, really, seriously, they, this is, shows you how the Jews of the Roman Empire really felt themselves to be a common nation, despite their differences in language and culture and where they lived and, and even their probably major differences in the way they practiced the Jewish tradition. But the temple was something that united all of the Jews. Paradoxically, it also divided Jews because, well, everybody agreed it was holy and everybody would band together and was attacked. Um, what was the big problem? They couldn't agree within Judea. Um, different groups couldn't agree on how the temple was supposed to be run. 
<laughs> so it was both a, a, a uniting factor, but it also caused divisions within the Jewish community, um, like the state of Israel today. <laughs> okay, uh, it, it's it's very very interesting. But in in times of danger, everybody's like you know banding together, and um, so um, if you go up to one ninety seven, um, and uh, you know the, this, he says these are the kinds of things. Um, that we're doing, and finally they said, you know, what are we sitting here for? Um, we ought to really try and um, uh, do what we can um, to to stop this. Um, and uh, Irma, you want to pick it up at 198? And they replied, you know, the principal and primary cause of all. And they're talking to, these are the people who brought the message. In other words, messengers arrived to the embassy. They, you know, so this is how the, this is the messengers then talking back. The messengers are Jews? Yeah, who could come from Judea or wherever they had come from. Right, go on. For that indeed is universally known to all men. He desires to be considered a god, and he conceives that the Jews alone are likely to be disobedient, and that therefore he cannot possibly inflict a greater evil or injury upon them than by defacing and insulting the holy dignity of their temple. For report prevails that it is the most beautiful of all temples in the world, inasmuch as it is continually receiving fresh accessions of ornament and has been for an infinite period of time a never-ending and boundless expense being lavished on it. And as he is a very contentious and quarrelsome man, he thinks of appropriating this edifice wholly to himself. And he's excited now on this subject to a much greater degree than before by a letter which Capito has sent to him. Now, Capito is a guy named Marcus Herennius Capito. He was an officer and a pro procurator for the Empress L Livia, the wife of Augustus, and also for the Emperors Tiberius and Caligula. And he was the procurator of Yavna, Yamnia. Um, and he, um, what, during the, this particular period, okay? So he's one of the people... Um, who is not, who is against uh, the Jews. And he talks about, in the next paragraph, they talk about who uh, Capito was, and about, and if you look at the bottom paragraph, Yamnia, what we call Yavna, and talks about how um, it's a large city with uh, Jews, but there's also um, other Jews, and, uh, other nations. Um, and if you turn over the page, they, um, he, he continues to talk about the history of how all of this um, came into effect. And this story of the statue now takes up the, uh, the, the central part of this work. All right. In other words, he gives us the whole account of the back and forth of this statue, uh, and that goes all the way um, to uh, number 348. So what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to skip uh, most of that. Um, um, you know, and he quotes letters, and, and, and in other words, the whole back and forth by which the Jews were lobbying to stop this happening, and the officer who was in charge, how they're trying, you know, how he was delaying it, um, and so on and so forth. In other words, if you want to read, I mean, Josephus has an account of this as well, um, it, it because the officer who was in charge of it obviously knew what was going to happen, and he tried to delay it as much as possible um, while what was, what was going on. Um, and um, if you then go to 349 on page 788, um, now it goes back um, to the uh, back, back to the um, uh, back back to the embassy. What what happens is the 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 um, uh, Petronius is the governor of Syria. He's he's the governor of uh, all of the area, which includes Judea. And Petronius is a smart man, and he sends a letter for delay. And then there's ba Herod Agrippa gets involved. Uh, there's a scene where Herod Agrippa meets with uh, Caligula and is so overcome he collapses. He gets a, when he recovers, he writes him a long letter appealing his decision. Um, and supposedly Gaius yields, um, but Philo is doubtful, uh, you know, that it's going to happen. And in fact, the latter part of this thing up to from 338 to 348 is Philo's denunciation of Gaius's treachery and cruelty. Um, so you want to read it, it's like, you know, you see how Herod Agrippa gets involved. It's this whole big deal. Uh, and everything's on a knife's edge, by the way. It really is.
Um, <coughs> but now in 349, um, he goes back to uh, the embassy. Um, and um, so, Irma, you want to pick it up there? It is worthwhile to make mention of what, of what we both saw and heard when we were sent for to encounter a contest on behalf of our national constitution. For the moment that we entered into the presence of the emperor, we perceived from his looks and from the state of agitation in which he was, that we had come not before a judge, but before an accuser, or rather, I should say, before the open enemy of those whom he looked upon as opposed to his will. For it would have been the part of a judge to sit with assessors selected because of their virtue and learning when a question of the greatest importance was being investigated, which had lain dormant for 400 years, and which was now raised for the first time among many myriads of Alexandrian Jews. Okay, in other words, what are the rights, what are the actual status of Alexandrian Jews? And it would have been proper for the contending parties with their advocates to stand on each side of him and for him to listen to them both in turn, first to the accusation, and then in turn to the defense, according to a period measured by water. And then retiring the judge, and then retiring, the judge should deliberate with his assessors as to what he ought publicly to deliver as his sentence on the justice of the case. But was actu what was actually done resembled rather the conduct of an implacable tyrant exhibiting uncontrolled authority and displeasure and pride. So he gives you what a court case should have been. All right. Cal, do you want to pick it up in 351? For besides that, he in no particular behaved in the manner which I have just been describing as proper, having sent for the managers of two gardens, the Mesentanian and the Lamian garden. And they are near one another and close to the city, in which he had spent three or four days. For that was the place in which this theatrical spectacle, aimed at the happiness of a whole nation, was intended to be enacted in our presence. He commanded all the outer buildings to be opened for him, for that he wished to examine them minutely. But we, as soon as we were introduced into his presence, the moment that we saw him, bent to the ground with all imaginable respect and adoration, and saluted him, calling him the Emperor Augustus. And he replied to us in such a gentle and courteous and humane manner that we not only despaired of attaining our object, but even of preserving our lives. You notice they were willing to bow down to him? Yeah. yeah. Okay, because they were smart. They knew what would happen if they didn't. Go on. For, said he, you are haters of God, inasmuch as you do not think that I am a God. I, who am already confessed to be a God by every other nation, but who am refused that appellation by you. And then, stretching up his hands to heaven, he uttered an ejaculation, which it was impious to hear, much more would it be so to repeat it literally. <laughs> so he's, he's, he's cursing them and, and whatever, really, you know. So you can just see the scene, right? I mean, it, it's very evocative of what happens. The Judeans never sent a delegation? This is, now they're back to what happened. This is now discussing the rights of the Alexandrians. The, it's not about the statue anymore. That's more or less been settled, okay, according okay. to Philo, okay. that he's promised to not do it. Okay. Um, uh, the fact is now they're going back to the situation of Just what happened in light of the pogroms, how Flaccus had taken away their rights, what are the rights of the Alexandrian Jews, which he said, of course, were well established for Augustus. Um, in effect, you know, this is the first time that there has been any kind of real public discussion of this in front of the ruling authority. Okay, and go on. And immediately all the ambassadors of the opposite portion were filled with all imaginable joy, thinking that their embassy was already successful on account of the first words uttered by Gaius. And so they clapped their hands and danced for joy and called him by every title which is applicable to any one of the gods. And while he was triumphing in these superhuman appellations, the sycophant Isidorus, who's an Alexandrian, part of the Alexandrian delegation, seeing the temper in which he was, said, O oh master, you will hate with still juster vehemence these men whom you see before you and their fellow countrymen, if you are made acquainted with their disaffection and disloyalty toward yourself. 
For when all other men were offering up sacrifices of thanksgiving to your safety, these men alone refused to offer any sacrifice at all. And when I say these men, I comprehend all the rest of the Jews. This is when Caligula had fallen sick. Okay, so he's claiming the Jews did not offer sacrifices for his, um, uh, for his recovery. Go on. And when we all cried out with one accord, O Lord Gaius, we are falsely accused. For we did sacrifice, and we offered up entire hecatombs, the blood of which we poured in libation upon the altar, and the flesh we did not carry to our homes to make a feast and banquet upon it, as it is the custom of some people to do, but we committed the victims entire to the sacred flame as a burnt offering. And we have done this three times already, and not only once only. On the first occasion when you succeeded to the empire, and the second time when you recovered from that terrible disease with which all the habitable world was afflicted at the same time, and the third time we sacrificed in hope of your victory over the Germans. Now this is interesting. Who, where did they sacrifice? Did they pay for pagan sacrifices, or did they're talking about sacrifices they sponsored in the temple in Jerusalem? Because they wouldn't have done it themselves because they don't do sacrifices in the Jews. So it, it, I think they're talking about sponsored sacrifices in the temple in Jerusalem, right? What kind of creature is a hecatomb? Um, it's a measure. It's a measure, yeah. In other words, huge amounts. Oh. Uh, Oh, it's not a specific. No, no, no. Okay. Uh, what, what, time, what, what time is it, by the way? Ten after. How long can, I mean, we're running a late, but we're all, I mean, Harvey, I took, I, I only got here, you know, like 20 after 10, so. I left for at 9 o'clock. Yeah, I, 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 I left Teaneck like 9.15. Um, uh, okay, we'll, we'll go on for a few more minutes, um, and then we'll make up the time at a later date, okay? Yeah, it's okay. Is everybody all right with staying for a little longer? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, Cal, you want to read on? Grant, said he, that all this is true, and that you did sacrifice. Nevertheless, you sacrificed to another god, and not for my sake. <laughs> and what good did it did you to me? In other words, sure, you didn't sacrifice, but you sacrificed to your god. You didn't sacrifice to me, so then what's the point? Go on. Moreover, you did not sacrifice to me. Immediately, a profound shuddering that came upon us. The first moment that we heard this expression, similar to that which overwhelmed us when we first came into his presence. And while he was saying this, he entered into the outer buildings, examining the chambers of the men and the chambers of the women, and the rooms on the ground floor and all the apartments in the upper story, and blaming some points of their preparation as defective and planning alterations and suggesting designs and giving orders himself to make them more costly. And then we were being driven about in this way, followed him up and down through the whole place, being mocked and ridiculed by our adversaries like people at a play in the theater. For indeed, the whole matter was a kind of farce. The judge assumed the part of an accuser and the accusers the part of an unjust judge who look upon the defendants with an eye of hostility and act in accordance with the nature of... Stop truth. there. So you can see, he's walking... They're not like sits in a place where they're having a meet. He's walking around looking at these palaces and they're trying to talk to him while he's walking. So he's treating them with the utmost disrespect. And of course, the Alexandrians, uh, uh, Greeks and Egyptians are thrilled. And they and again, it, it, it's quite interesting what he says, that it's like a play, like a farce, like a comedy, you know, uh, not a dignified... Uh, court case the way it really should be, and it shows the 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 really um, the rough treatment, um, you know how they're they're you know really that he he is against them right from the beginning, and they know that they're really in trouble. Um, let's skip down to um, three uh, sixty one. Ellie, do you want to pick it up there? But when he had given some of his orders. When he had given some of his orders about the buildings, he then asked a very important and solemn question. Why is it that you abstain from eating pig's flesh? And then again at this question, such a violent laughter was raised by our adversaries, partly because they were really delighted, and partly because they wished to court the emperor out of flattery, and therefore wished to make it appear that this question was dictated by wit and uttered with grace. 
that some of the servants who were following him were indignant at their appearing to treat the emperor with so little respect, since it was not safe for his most intimate friends to do so so much as smile at his words. This is interesting. The, the Alexandrians break out and uh, think this is a joke. And the emperor's servants are like, ah, uh, no, and nobody's supposed to, to, to laugh at what he says. <laughs> Read on. And when we may answer that different nations have different laws, and there are some things of which the use are forbidden both to us and to our adversaries. And when someone said there are also many people who do not eat lamb's flesh, mm -hmm. which is the most tender of all meat, he laughed and said they are quite right, for it is not nice. Being jumped with and, and trifled with and ridiculed in this manner, we were in great perplexity. And at last he said, in a rapid and peremptory manner, I desire to know what principles of justice you recognize with regard to your constitution. So he's mocking Jewish practice, and now all of a sudden he wants to know, you know, how do you operate according to your uh, laws? Okay? This is not good, but I mean... Philo is very good at, you know, giving us this first-hand account and evocative of the of the whole situation and what was going on. I mean, this is really... Was it safe to publish at the time? Well, he, uh, Caligula was, this, was dead by this when this was published. And his enemies were in charge? Well, Claudius was, yeah. I mean, Claudius obviously didn't care. I mean, partly, I mean, this is actually uh, in many ways aimed at Claudius. Um, uh, because he, you know, he want they want Claudius to be the emperor who's going to give them real justice, and and not like Caligula, um, and you will see that Claudius did in fact uh, deal with the situation, but not to their hundred percent satisfaction. I read a little further, and when we began, when we began to reply to him and to explain it, as soon as he had a taste of our pleading on the principles of justice, and as soon as he perceived that our arguments were not contemptible, before we could bring forward the more important thing which we had to say, but a short... Cut us short. and short, and ran forward and burst into the principal building. <laughs> and as soon as he had entered, he commanded the windows which were around it to be filled up with transparent pebbles very much resembling white crystals which do not hinder light but which keep out the wind and the heat of the sun. That's an interesting architectural yeah, yeah. point. They use they use um, well, quartz to their windows so that they can have light but keep out the yeah. wind and the sun, you know, go on. Then proceeding on deliberately, he asked in a more moderate tone, what are you saying? And when we began to connect our reply with what we had said before, he again ran on and went into another house in which he had commanded some ancient and aboriginal pictures to be placed. For when our pleadings on behalf of justice were thus broken down and cut short and interrupted and crushed as one may almost say, we being weary and exhausted and having no strength left in us being, but being in continual expectation of nothing else than death could no longer keep our hearts as they had been. But in our agony, we took refuge in supplications to the one true God, praying him to check the wrath of this falsely called God. And he took compassion on us and turned his mind to pity. We became pacified, merely said, these men do not appear to me to be wicked so much as unfortunate and foolish and not believing that I have been endowed with the nature of God. And so he dismissed us and commanded us to depart. And, and what happens is, is that uh, what follows is that they, they, um, they, they, they basically try to, uh, they do get to say what they wanted to say, um, but then he dismissed us. Um, and, and he basically, in 371, uh, Philo is lamenting the fact that um, if he doesn't, uh, you know, protect us, then the Jews anywhere will be in danger from people who wish to attack them. And then 372, you know, he, he talks about, you know, how they ended up um, just feeling like terrible about what had happened and how they had failed. Um, and in effect, under, Claudia, uh, under, under Gaius, they had failed. Claudius, Caligula was not interested in them. 
uh, he, you know, whether he was insane or whatever, um, uh, the Alexandrians appear to um, have won. Um, and in, at the end of it, in 373, he actually had planned um, to write um, uh, an a further attack on uh, Gaius. And if he did, we don't have it. Um, so what happened? Well, here, if you go to the material I gave you, at the bottom of page um, uh, three, um, this is what, again, Josephus's accounts and uh, Philo's accounts don't 100% jibe with each other, but that's not unusual um, in these ancient accounts that, you know, we don't necessarily have, uh, you know, a picture-perfect account of what happened in exact, of course, that happens today, right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And so, the, um, Paul, no do you... secret tapes. Well, yeah, exactly. But, you know, when you compare the two accounts, more or less, you know, uh, agree with what happened. Even if some of the details, like where was Grippa and all of, I mean, where where was Agrippa when the pogroms started? Was he in Alexandria? Was he in Rome? I mean, what that whole story, um, that kind of thing, we just you know can't figure out necessarily. Uh, you know, I guess they tried, but anyway, um, Paul, do you want to read this? This is on Josephus um, writing about what happened. Yeah. Uh, the bottom of page three in our in, in the material I gave you last week. Josephus really tells us. You know, has a, has an account of what happened. You know, before it was yeah. found very interesting that when they actually pray to their God, yes, he let them go. Yeah, wouldn't that have been fury? I mean, you know, you'd think they're not praying to him; they're praying to. Well, you know, what was was Caligula? You know, um, was he a, a you know mentally? Uh, dis uh, the Romans certainly thought so. Yeah. You know, yeah. so um, Paul, you see where it says now about this time. Last paragraph. Last paragraph, page three. No, no that's that's page two. No, this page three. This, the, uh, we'll flip, maybe you printed it differently. Turn it over. It's, it's where it says Josephus. Oh, is that, that, I think you've got the wrong, I think that's from the first lecture. Now about this time. Now about this time, there was a sedition between Jews and the Greeks at the city of Alexandria. Uh, for when Gaius was dead, the nation of Jews, which had been, which had been very mo much mortified under the reign of Gaius, and we so in other words, when, when Caligula is assassinated, there are, and this again is, um, I think while the embassy, the embassy is still in, um, is still in, um, uh, uh, still in Rome, okay, R further riots break out. Evidently, the Jews, um, you know, heartened by the death of uh, Caligula, um, that um, uh, he's, he, what, there may have been further outbreaks, okay? Now, we're talking about um, the, the Alexand the delegation had arrived in 40. 41 um, is when Caligula is assassinated and uh, Claudius becomes emperor. So this is, uh, the, the embassy is still there. Read on. So uh, Claudius sent an order to the president of Egypt to quiet that turmoil. He also sent an edict at, at the request of King Agrippa and King Herod, both to Alexandria and to Syria, uh, whose contents was found. Now, what Josephus does, he actually uh, copies the formal proclamation that Claudius did about what happened. So it begins with his uh, title, Tiberius Claudius Caesar Augustus Germanicus, high priest and tribune um, of the people. Okay, and uh, Paul, pick it up on the next page where it says, since I am assured. Since I am assured that the Jews of Alexandria, called Alexandrians, have been 
a joint in happiness in the earliest uh, times of the uh, Alexandrians and have obtained from their king equal privileges uh, with them as it is evident by the public records that are in their possession and the edicts uh, themselves and, uh, and that, that after Alexandria uh, has been subject to our empire by Augustus, their rights and privileges have been preserved by those presidents. Okay, we can stop there. So the point is, he is affirming the fact that they had rights and privileges from the Ptolemaic kings and that Augustus had done it. And then he talks about Achilla, uh, who was the governor between uh, in, in Alexandria. Um, and then even when it says the Jewish ethnarch, um, that may that's probably first to Philo's uh, brother or his father, um, was dead. Augustus did not prohibit the making of such ethnarchs. In other words, the Jews had the right to have a local uh, governor, govern, government. Um, and so they um, continued in you know, their old... Um, Customs, but then notice what he says. But that in the time of Gaius, the Alexandrians became insolent towards the Jews that were among them, which Gaius, out of his great madness mm -hmm. and want of understanding, reduced the nations of the Jews very low, because they would not transgress the religious worship of their country and call him a god. I will therefore that the notion that Jews not be provided with their rights and privileges on account of the madness of Gaius, but those rights and privileges which they formerly enjoyed be preserved to them, and that they may continue in their own customs. I charge that both parties to take very care. So in other words, um, and again, we can see that Claudius is, of course, urged on this by Agri King Agrippa, uh, Herod Agrippa, and, um, and, and how, in effect, what Claudius does is to restore the situation back to its previous situation, okay? And in the second one, it talks about um, you know, how this should be true throughout the Roman Empire because they're, they're, they're friendly to the Jews, uh, to the Romans, and so on and so forth. Um, and, um, but in the, in the last part of the, num the bottom paragraph, he charges the Jews not to show contempt. Uh, notice this, he uses the word superstitious observances of other, in other words, the other customs of other parties, but to keep their, law, uh, their own laws only. All right? So, um, what happens is, is that Claudius restores things to the status quo. The Jews don't get their full um, citizenship rights in Alexandria, but they do get the protection of what occurred um, previously. In other words, they don't, um, they don't lose uh, what they had, but they don't get anything else. In other words, they don't get what they really wanted, which was to be um, equal uh, to the um, to the Alexandrians, um, everything goes back to status quo. But of course, that's like you know the pot. That's like putting a lid on a boiling pot. The underlying issues had not been resolved, and the hatred between the Greek Alexandrians and Egyptian Alexandrians and the Jewish Alexandrians continues to bubble under the surface. And what happens, of course, is that you know twenty years later, um, uh, it breaks out again in riots that spread all, you know, again, the riots start in Eretz Yisrael, they spread to Alexandria, but that's the beginning of the revolt in Eretz Yisrael, which causes the destruction of the temple. Um, the situation in Alexandria ha was put down uh, with the, you know, by the Romans, um, with thousands of them being slaughtered by the Roman legionnaires. Um, this is under um, Philo's nephew, <laughs> Uh, who commanded them? Philo was is not alive uh, uh, at, at, by this point. Very likely, he probably he passed away. Uh, very likely, um, so his his nephew brings the Roman army down upon them, um, causing thousands of casualties. Uh, and then, so we can imagine that the community is very badly uh, beaten up by this. Um, and then, you know, um, 40, 50 years later, it's virtually destroyed. Uh, so what happens is the underlying issues don't get resolved. They, they really don't get resolved. They, they basically go back um, to uh, square one. Um, in the material I had given you last time, 
I gave you some, we're not going to look at them. He, there's also some other little parts you can uh, learn about Philo's political philosophy. Um, he, uh, in, in some of his other works, he talks about political expediency, the need for politicians sometimes to do what is expedient, even when it's not right. Um, he talks about worldly ambitious and pride. If you'll take a look, um, the first three works on dreams and Joseph, they're all around the figure of Joseph. Because for Philo, Joseph is the Jewish politician par excellence. And what's interesting is, is that in the work on the dreams, he's rather negative about Joseph. And that was more of an internal sort of document. But in the work Joseph, which is more for non-Jews, he's a lot more um, uh, uh, praise, he praises Joseph as in a world as the ideal politician. Joseph, for at least to the non-Jewish world, becomes for him um, the ideal politician. Okay. Um, we really had, unfortunately, uh, you know, <laughs> a bad time. We're going to try and make it up um, over the next time. One thing I have to say is, uh, originally I was planning on having a class next week, but I have to, we're going to Maine for the end. Of, so we're going to be meeting in two weeks, and then we'll be running all the way through straight to the end. Okay? So we'll be adding on one more date. I will send out an email about it. Let me stop this. Hang on a second.